Check. One, two, three. The D. Three. Three. Yeah. This is the D. Three. Go. Your guide to Detroit. Your guide to Detroit's arts and entertainment scene. This is the D. Three. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Seth Ressler and I have on the line with me Josh Wakely. Josh is the man behind a number of very exciting projects, one of which is a daytime Emmy Award winning cartoon called Beat Bugs, which is based on the music of the Beatles. But Josh, I'm so glad you're here because this, of course, is a podcast about Detroit. And you also have a very cool project, a cartoon that's on Netflix called Motown Magic. And I am a fan, so I'm really excited to have you here talking to me. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Seth. And yeah, a pleasure to be speaking to the, the, the people of Detroit. It's a, it's a great city. There, there may be no city that's given more great art in the world. So yeah, it's a pleasure. Now, you uh, are the creator, the director, and the producer of Motown Magic, but uh, you're out in Los Angeles, and I'm can tell by your accent that Los Angeles is probably not your original home either. So how did you come to this point where you were creating this cartoon about, I don't think it ever really says that it's based in Detroit, but it's clearly based in a place that's very similar to Detroit. Yeah, look, it's, it's unusual, isn't it? I mean, I guess where art comes from and who the, who the, the creative uh, guide for it is. Um, look, uh, uh, obviously, yeah, with my, I'm sure the um, audience is struggling to understand my mumbly Australian accent. Uh, I grew up in sort of um, country Australia. Uh, but um, uh, the first concert that I, I saw properly at about nine years old was Stevie Wonder. Um, my, my mother, who was a huge fan, won tickets on the radio. And that was a big deal in our family. And we went down and it was a, a visceral and, 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 and genuinely uh, life-changing experience. And so... Uh, it was always uh, huge and, and um, important for me. And then uh, a lot of my professional career has been here in the States. And, and then at some point, um, I think, uh, you know, I, I went and, uh, you know, paid homage to uh, to Motown and, and went and saw Detroit. And it stayed in my bones and clearly in my imagination. And at some point I decided to make this show about, uh, yeah, about Ben who lives in a town called Motown. Um, yeah, but it's, which is a little bit my imagination, a little bit inspired by the uh, the greats of uh, of the music of Motown, but um, there's a lot of Detroit in it, yeah. Yeah, I gotta say, and I don't watch a lot of cartoons these days, but my girlfriend has grandkids, one six, one two, and I was having a day where I was just like, okay, if I hear Baby Shark one more time, I'm gonna shoot <laughs> myself in the head. And, and so, you know, I knew that we had talked about this cartoon on the podcast, and, and so we went looking for it, and... One of the things that really amazes me about the cartoon, uh, I'm not a Detroit native. You know, I moved here uh, about four years ago at this point. And this captures a lot of the essence of this city uh, in the cartoon. Everything from uh, the ethnic composition of the neighborhoods to the street art that you see all over Detroit. I mean, how did you capture that feel of the city? People always ask you know that about it. Lots of different art, and I always have had the same answer in in any of my uh, in any of my work, and it's one that I've seen some people I admire is that I really um, I kind of just listen to my imagination, and and without sounding making it sound too esoteric or like woo woo, I you know at some point if you're meant to do something and it's meant to be out in the world, you kind of um, uh, it's placed down in your imagination. I always think there's a writer. Um, I'm, I'll probably get the pronunciation of his name, Gamario Ariaga, and he always he wrote this the movie Babel, which won you know uh, awards around the world, and it's set in Japan and and uh, Mexico and um, and London, and it's, and they went and said, oh, so what was your experience of Japan? He said, I've never been there. I, I don't have to. I just imagine it. And uh, at some point, you kind of the detail comes to you. Um, that being said, you know, I worked in a I, I led a writing room. It wasn't just me, and um, I did uh, staff it with a lot of Detroit uh, locals and writers, and so that that gave us a huge kind of um, entry into the world. And then Don Woz, who's a Detroit legend, um, he's the producer for the Rolling Stones and a lot of uh, sort of leads out a lot of big Motown um, uh, redux stuff these days. He's from Detroit. So I was always talking to people, always listening, um, and uh, yeah, and always trying to uh, in- imbibe that into the work. 
Well, you have some famous Detroiters who are involved, not just Don Was, who, uh, little known fact, the first CD I ever won in a radio contest was Was Not Was. Uh, I was a big fan of the song <laughs> Walk the Dinosaur when I was like nine years old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you've got a lot of big names involved, including Smokey Robinson. Tell me about his role and how he got involved. Yeah, I mean, like that's that's the the most iconic uh, Detroit uh, person I have uh, involved in the show. And, and look, um, I wasn't going to do this. Obviously, I am a guy from Australia, and, uh, and I wanted to. Um, my favorite music. Look, I love all music, but I, I really am passionate about Motown music. And so I wasn't going to do it though, unless I got um, sort of the blessing from uh, one of the the elders, I guess. So I did a list, which was Barry Gordy, um, Stevie Wonder, and uh, and Smokey Robinson. And then I decided that Smokey Robinson was sort of the best person to approach because he was both, you know, just not just a significant artist, but just perhaps I think America's most underrated artist. He's just just a cavalcade of number ones um, sort of drove the, the creation of Motown sound, you know, just my girl, um, Tracks of My Tears, etc. And so in order to prove that it was worth doing, I, I did a, like a four-minute animation and I did a couple of um, – I let out uh, with my writing team a couple of the scripts and I let out uh, with my musical team the, a couple of the uh, songs, which was a hugely expensive way to, to prove whether it was um, going to happen. And, and it, Beat Bugs had been a hit and Netflix wanted to do something else with me. And I, I, I knew that the show could get made, but I wanted to get his blessing. And so at this point we were you know, well into kind of feeling like making a show, but I had made it very clear that, that if Smokey said we shouldn't do it, then we wouldn't do it. And uh, he came into my office. It's great. I always try and tell younger um, people that work for me now that Smokey Robinson was on time, so there's no reason why anyone else can't be. He was there on time. Um, he rocked into my office, my, my very little office, and was completely um, – has a very humble energy for a, you know, a true great. And he sat down and watched the, the couple of minutes that I'd made of the animation – and then he read the scripts and then he listened to the music and then he, he opened up those fairly – he has blue eyes, iconic blue eyes, and said, we're meant to do this. Let's do this. And, and gave me a big hug and he was there all the way and um, a huge contributor, um, extraordinary to be re-recording My Girl, which is what I did with him. And he would just uh, – you know, you'd think, well, hang on, how did they do that bass line? And he'd tell you a story of when they you know, were in the room originating it. So – a hugely important figure in, in American culture and, and just but just a massively awesome collaborator. Yeah, that's got to be surreal. You re-recorded a lot of the songs. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, I re-recorded 53 songs. I did it in uh, my soundtrack partner is Capitol Records, who are just great. We did it in uh, Studio A of Capitol Records, iconic studio, Beatles, uh, Rolling Stones, Frank Sinatra. And... We would go in there every day, Don, Don was, and we had um, you know, uh, Michael Beard and Ray Parker Jr., a Motown legend, also came up with the Ghostbusters uh, theme. These were all sort of Motown legends. And uh, we would sit and sort of recreate it, and it already suits uh, children's ears perfectly, but we would think, how can we enhance it even further for children? We added strings, uh, brass. Um, there was no sort of expense spared. Yeah, to make it um, hugely special. And and look, you know, at one level I thought maybe this is the last time these original Motown guys get to to re-record it. You know, it's, it's a fairly unique set of circumstances. So they they came into it with gusto and it was, uh, um, it, it was you know, an extraordinary experience. We were re-recording 53 of those songs, which, you know, as I always – I'm always a little bit exhausted when I finish one of these shows and I think that that, that, that in itself is, you know, that separate from doing the show, that's that's um, a lot of work for everybody, and, and hopefully, um, hopefully it shows in the show just how much we cared about the music. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I wanted to know how you write a plot for an episode. Do you actually start with a particular song and then create an episode plot around it, or what's that process? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, Seth. I get asked this question a lot, and it's one of those things. Um, as my wife would like to point out, I'm a bad cook. Not a great driver. Um, <laughs> uh, that it happens at the same time. I can hear a song and know how it fits the story. Or sometimes, sometimes the story comes first, and then I go, "Oh, you know, it would be stop in the name of love would be a perfect song for that." So um, I can never really answer it um, as accurately as I want to. It's it's uh, it's an organic marriage of the two things. Um, I, I really make sure that the the characters, you know, Ben is a you know. An, 
know, you're an African American boy with a lot of heart, and Angie is, you know, um, the child of a single parent in home in this in Detroit, and she's she's got a lot of spunk and grit. And um, Ella is um, Ben's sister, is you know, um, wild and full of imagination and too much energy. And I, I think I really try and make them real in my head is the point, and and fill them with kind of real problems and real goals and real adventures that they want to have. And then I'm constantly listening to the music, and at some point they kind of just connect, and then I'm away with the story. And, and then the the writing team and me, we you know we, the, the, I, get, I think that's the big point of difference. Not there's some spectacular children shows out in the world right now, but we sat in rooms for days and days and days trying to break scripts, the same rigor you would with any um, adult drama show. So that that once you've kind of got the original idea, you you then um, sit and work it through. Yeah, so you got something good. Yeah, one of the things that really caught my attention was the way that the plots for these episodes sometimes tackle fairly grown-up problems. I mean, I'm thinking of the episode where Angie wants her parents to get back together uh, and the things that she's going through with that. And that really just kind of made me stand up and go, oh, wow. Uh, I mean, talk about your attitude towards addressing some of those issues. Yeah, look, I mean, my background and it's probably what I'll go straight back into now. I've got um, young children now, so I wanted to make some um, animated shows for them, but um, and that was sort of in my head. I was you know, my first audience, but I come from a sort of you know gritty drama, and and uh, concerned me that I would watch children shows that didn't deal with with life. They were sort of, um, and they used to. You know, I grew up listening, you know, uh, listening, reading Roald Dahl or um, you know Spielberg's films. Certainly, um, deal with divorce and um, and the complications that that come from you know li- from living. And then there kind of had been this thing that had happened in the last decade when I started to watch children's shows with my five-year-old where they were sort of so acidically happy and so overly um, alternate in their reality that they didn't actually – they weren't imparting any kind of moral lesson or, or any lesson. Um, uh, and, you know, that is uh, – should it always be the goal of any storyteller to, to, uh, to, to prompt some insight in the audience, whether they're 50 or five. Um, so yeah, look, we deal with divorce and bullying and uh, uh, lack of self-esteem and um, and finding your identity and you know um, culturally or otherwise in, in in these episodes. And I was I really wanted to push the uh, the boundaries there, and I'm, I'm, it's the thing that I'm probably the proudest of that um, the creative team pulled off. Nice. Well, look, season one came out last fall. Uh, mm-hmm. Is there any word on a season two? Do we know anything yet? Anything you can tell us? Uh, stay tuned. Yeah, okay. I think, uh, yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> I know you've got other projects in the works. I mean, uh, there's been what, two seasons of beat bugs so far is, you know, what's going uh, on with that? Three, three seasons in a special. There's some, yeah, some more stuff happening in that space. And then, um, I'm working on a, um, uh, a gritty adult drama now. I'm um, about, uh, the characters of Bob Dylan and, um, yeah, it's, it's deeply exciting to me. Oh, so yeah. yeah, I know you're also working with the Bob Dylan music, but that's not going to be a cartoon like these other two then. No, no, it isn't. No, right. that would be a that would be an unusual mix. Yes, yeah, so I know. Well, but, I was um, going to say I'm a big Tupac that, fan, so if I can put a plug in, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. I think they're making they're making a movie right now, huh? Um, that, that there's a Tupac movie thing there. Um, but I'm really hoping that um that Netflix, uh, yeah, that, that that they see many more seasons. There's five thousand songs in the catalog, so I'm I'm hoping this lives for a while. I'd say it's perfect because, you know, obviously we have an Amazon Echo at home and when there are kids around that are, you know, two and six years old, the one thing that we found is that the easiest thing to say when you want to put music on is just say, Alexa, play Motown, because (laughs) you know that everything that you're going to hear is safe. And that's not necessarily true with, with anything else that you can say. Yeah, you're right. When there was a cartoon series around it and a cartoon series that frankly adults can watch and enjoy it's fantastic so congratulations I, I really am a big fan thanks seth yeah it means a lot and yeah that was the goal to try and give something that you felt um great about your kids watching but that you could sit down and watch with them and, and um and enjoy as well because we, we all have limited time and, and children are going to watch television so you want to see if you can spend that time with them if possible and and not want to uh, baby shark your brain out yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, perfect. Well, Josh, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time. The show is Motown Magic. People can find it on Netflix. Uh, it uses a, a lot of the music of Motown, and it's absolutely fantastic. And there's a soundtrack out there that people can get if they want to hear these new versions as well, right? Yeah, there is a soundtrack. It's got, you know, um, Neo, Becky G, a lot of new contemporary artists uh, covering it as well as Smokey Robinson. 
yeah, with new versions of uh, of his classic songs. So yeah, that's out on uh, Capitol Records who put that out, and nothing would make me happier than um, Detroit locals listening to that music on um, wherever you find music. It's um, it's a, it's a great city. I'm very pl- I'm, I'm very uh, privileged that it, it lent me some of its great uh, artistic work to uh, to make a show out for a little while. Well, Josh Wakeley, thank you so much. Thanks so much, sir. The D Brief. Your guide to Detroit's art and entertainment scene.